want to I just want to welcome everybody today to the needs community engagement meeting uh, event and uh, we're very fortunate to once again for the second time this week welcome um, representative staff from the Canada Border Services Agency this um, this needs community engagement event is, is about opportunities within the CBSA and uh, we are doing this needs community engagement event as a collaboration between the National Educational Association of Disabled Students, which I'm representing as the national coordinator, along with a couple of consultants and board members that are here, and uh, the Quebec Association for Equity and Inclusion in Post-Secondary Education at CAPS, and we're we're, we welcome uh, Jill DeBoff, who's communications director for ACEPS, uh, to this to this event. Who should be speaking in just a couple of minutes on on Wednesday when we had the the, the first presentation in French only. Uh, Yannick Rac Rassico, who's the executive director, uh, facilitated that event. And Jill participated as well. And um, so it's important to note that the uh, CBSA values inclusiveness and is com committed to recruiting a diverse workforce that reflects our country's population. And we're really excited that, um, that they reached out to us, Jessica Alves reached out to us a couple of weeks ago or about a month ago now, I guess, to, to uh, discuss opportunities within the Canada Border Services Agency. Um, and we, we, we had suggested we, an opportunity perhaps to share those, op those positions um, that are available and, uh, the, and opportunities within the CBSA and also present an opportunity for CBSA uh, representatives to speak to community in this, in this event. I would, before I turn it over to Jilda, I'd like to um, offer a land acknowledgement the National Educational Association of Disabled Students Needs acknowledges the homelands of the Indigenous peoples of this place, we now call Canada, and honors the many territorial and region keepers of the treaty and unceded territory lands of which Needs serves as a national human rights organization of people with disabilities working for an inclusive and accessible Canada. And I will turn it over to Alan now. Just, oh, sorry, I will turn it over to Gilda now. Um, before I do that, I just want to mention that we do have professional real time captioning available. I put the link in the chat and uh, take it away, Gilda. Thanks, Frank. Okay, well, hi, everyone, um, and welcome. Uh, as Frank said, my name is Jilda. I'm the Director of Communications and Linguistic uh, Services at ACEPS, and we are located on uh, the unceded Indigenous lands of uh, the Kenyan Kehaka uh, Mohawk Nation, which is called uh, Montreal today. So I will introduce the speakers. Uh, we have Yeya Abdel Latif, who is currently the acting, acting team lead for the recruitment and partnership team at the CBSA. Uh, he possesses more than 10 years experience in staffing where he's worked in numerous organizations and has joined uh, the public service in January of 2017. Uh, Yeya uh -huh. joined uh, the CBSA in September 2020 as a nature advisor and his team primarily focuses on promoting non-uniformed positions. Um, then we have Nicole Pichet, who's been with the Canada Border Services Agency for over 20 years. Uh, she's worked as a frontline border service officer and as superintendent at the Port of Cornwall in Ontario. She was part of the CDU team, uh, meaning the contraband detection team and the enforcement committee. 
Uh, some of her other assignments include being a facilitator at the CBSA College in Rigaud in Quebec, uh, Indigenous Community Court Liaison Officer, Superintendent at the Ottawa Airport and Ship Clearances in Nunavut. She was also a member of the assessment team and interview team. And as of January 2021, she was a member of the recruiting team. So speakers, uh, it's up to you now. Good afternoon. I hope Yaha is here because I don't see him in the, uh, the presentation. He was having here, some... Nicole. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I'm here, Nicole. Wonderful. That, uh, I keep on cutting. Keep on cutting. Uh, some uh, let, allow, allow me to share my screen. Hello. Yeah, that's good. So while he's doing that, I'll just explain a little bit about myself. Uh, you have already got my bio, but I wanted to let you know that presently I am in Cornwall, Ontario, which is. Uh, Mohawk territory of Aquasasne and Cornwall. I have um, been very fortunate with my career. This has been my second career. My first one was as a social worker with um, a juvenile detention center. And then I joined uh, CBSA 20, some, 20 plus years ago. I have, like I said, I've had a very wonderful career. I think CBSA is a wonderful place to, to work. It's got the team atmosphere. We're always uh, working with each other and the agency is always working with the employees for the better of the employee and the agency. Uh, just so you're aware, I am personally a person with a uh, learning disability. I am dyslexic and I have a, a difficulty with math, but that has not stopped me from being able to enjoy a extremely interesting and fun and engaging career with CBSA. And I've had nothing but support the entire way through with my career. So I will let uh, my partner here come. Okay, uh, so good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I should say. Well, depending on where you are. So uh, once again, my name is Yaya Abdel Latif. I'm acting to me for the Recruitment and Partnerships team uh, here at the CBSA. Uh, so our team is responsible for non-uniform positions. And um, so I started my career in public service back in uh, 2017. Uh, I applied through an external staffing process where uh, I worked for another government department. So I do possess more than 10 years of experience in the, uh, uh, in, in the human resources field, per se. Uh, and then I joined CBSA in 2020 as an HR advisor. So I just did a lateral move. And then um, now I'm acting team lead uh, since December of 2020 until today. Uh, so if someone could just allow me to, or give me permission to share my screen so we can start the presentation and uh, because it's telling me that it's disabled. Uh, so if somebody can do that, that would be great. Uh, in the meantime, while I get that, okay, thank you. Okay, there we go. All right. So who we are, uh, the CBSA has uh, approximately 14,000 employees, including over 6,500 uniformed employees who provide services at approximately 1,200 points across Canada and at 39 international locations. Our organization is made up of nine branches and one group reporting directly to the president. Uh, so we have the CBSA assessment and revenue management branch, the chief transformation officer branch, commercial and trade, finance and corporate management, the HR branch, information science and technology branch, intelligence and enforcement branch, internal audit and program evaluation, strategic policy, and the travelers branch. The CBSA hired approximately 1,000 students across Canada for the summer of 2019, and we hire students all year round. So as you can see on the map here, we have uh, seven regions across Canada, so namely Atlantic, Quebec, Southern Ontario, Northern Ontario, the, the GTA, Prairie, Pacific, and the uh, Vancouver area. Uh, and in addition, our headquarters is located uh, in the National Capital Region in Ottawa, Ontario. 
So what we do um, in 2019-2020, we processed 94.6 million travelers, 25.8 million cars, 35.3 million air passengers, and 83,991 trains and vessels. The CVSA manages 117 land border crossings and operates at 13 international airports. Of these land border crossings, 61 operate on a 24-7 basis, as well as 10 of the international airports. Officers carry out marine operations in major ports, the large being Halifax, Montreal, Vancouver, and at numerous marinas and reporting stations. Officers also perform operations at 27 rail sites. The CVSA processes and examines national mail at three mail centers in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. The CBSA administers more than 90 acts, regulations, and international agreements, many on behalf of other federal departments and agencies, the province, and the territories. So what we do, we welcome people in. Uh, in 2019, 2020, the CBSA processed 29,826 asylum claimants, and we processed also 4,827 temporary resident permits and extensions, 324,608 work permits and extensions, 245,550 study permits and extensions, and 58,760 visitor records and extensions. Upon arriving in Canada, Individuals can make a claim for refugee protection by speaking to a border services officer at any CBSA port of entry. The border services officer decides whether the claim is eligible to be referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. If the claim is eligible, it is sent referred to the Refugee Protection Division and the claim for refugee protection process is started. We are also responsible for welcoming travelers international students and returning Canadians from their international trips. So I will pass it on to Nicole now, who will uh, address the next couple of slides. Still on the uh, welcoming people to Canada slide. I think you need to stop sharing. Uh, no, I need, uh, there we go. Oh, okay. So, um, as uh, Yeha was saying, we have uh, been able to uh, process all those people, but uh, during our examination of cars, baggages, uh, trains, and every uh, other convenience possible, we uh, do detect or interdict the, um, the entry of firearms. We have had at least 13,745 weapons and firearm seizures in that one year alone. On average, we have approximately two firearm seizures a day. That's 365 days a year, every year, every time. Oops, yeah, we've lost your, uh, your presentation. Uh, so as I was saying, we have uh, seized over uh, 3,000 firearms in that year. So maybe I should follow and Okay, so other than that, we have also interdicted drugs and uh, firearms, uh, sorry, drugs and other products that are uh, dangerous to Canadian citizens. We have a very high standard of uh, um, Health Canada standards for uh, food and other products that are entered our body like soap and deodorants. So we also have to make sure that the, 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 uh, the products that come into Canada are within our standards. Um, we have also the, the illicit drug marks that we interdict and also currency. It is a, a legal obligation for anyone entering or exiting Canada to report that they have more than $10,000 with them. Uh, because they have to report it, it isn't taxable. We don't take a share of the money. We don't, we just have to record it and ensure that the uh, money is a legitimate money. It's if you uh, sold a property and that's where the money come from, so you can easily prove that that is your money. So it's not going to terrorist organization or it is it the product of illicit crime. So it is a responsibility of an individual to make sure that they declare 
more than $10,000 or more when they leave or enter Canada. And if they don't, we are responsible for seizing the money. And we have had over $27 million in currency seizures in that one year. We have also had to remove over 11,527 people from Canada. These are people that have come to Canada for one purpose and have overstayed their, their intended stay. They can stay for a period of six months and now they've stayed longer or they're working illegally in Canada or have entered Canada under false pretense or even have uh, not declared themselves properly at the border. And sometimes, and a lot of times in these cases, they also have a lot of criminality. That's what renders them inadmissible to Canada. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, top left uh, image is of uh, a firearm seizure that we had. As I was explaining earlier, we have at least an average of two firearm seizures every day at CBSA across all of our ports of entry. Top right hand corner, that's a seizure of uh, currency that was undeclared, and it was also deemed to be proceeds of crime. Bottom uh, left, that's a pineapple, but it's not the pineapple that's the problem, it's the person cored out the pineapple and put uh, cocaine inside the pineapple. So that uh, was a shipment of drugs that was seized at, I believe that was the Vancouver Port of Entry. And next to that on the, on the bottom right is some meat products that was seized as it was not declared and it was not properly imported. Um, other countries do not treat their uh, food market the same as we do. And uh, we're very worried about pesticides or uh, infestations of any type of uh, vermin that could actually uh, be invasive to Canadian farming and farm animals. And so we have to make sure that if you are bringing in food from another country that it meets our standards. It's very important to declare those goods. Um, even uh, diplomats have to declare their foods, even though they, diplomatic immunity does not apply to the health and uh, uh, plants of animal, health in Canada, plants and animal act. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, commercial, we have had over $21.8 million in commercial uh, release. So that's every time a, a, a tractor trailer <laughs> or a, tank, a tanker or a tra train arrives with uh, goods that are going to be entering the market to Canadian market, we have had over 21 million entries. We've had over 54 uh, million courier shipments. Uh, those are smaller companies that go over to the States, pick up packages and bring them back to Canada to then uh, distribute to the people who've, who've um, ordered them over overseas or in the United States. So those are your packages, uh, for example, like Amazon that are coming from the U.S. or uh, Walmart.com instead of the, uh, Walmart.ca. So that's 54 million carrier shipments and I can well imagine these are old statistics from 2018 or 2019 so you can imagine with the COVID right now and the increase of uh, online shopping that has increased drastically. We also have had 30 uh, billion dollars in duties and taxes and excise collected at our uh, land borders and airports. Commercial is a very important part of our economy, and we have to make sure that we in, uh, keep it uh, fair and equitable for all of our own producers, our own businesses. So we do uh, examine a lot of uh, uh, containers and commercial um, uh, trucks when they arrive at our border. One of my first day, uh, I had been an officer for nine months, and my first day in a commercial office, my training coach told me that I had to refer uh, and examine a, a tractor trailer. And I finally was able to pick one load that I wanted to examine. And after that, I noticed uh, in the examination that there was over $2.5 million of undeclared machine parts in the, in the uh, vehicle. It ended up having almost uh, $3,700,000 worth of duties and taxes and penalties that had to be paid. So I, to this day, 
whenever I think of having to go back on the front line or if like my, if my chief was to come and say, we need extra help today, can you help out? And I would definitely want to go back to doing an examination of tractor trailers. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the uh, front line uh, position that I was doing when I was in Cornwall. So at, uh, the, as a border management, we have tons of different uh, uh, employments. We have the frontline officers. Those are the ones that will be doing the uh, welcoming you back to Canada at the border, asking you all sorts of questions to, to ensure that the people and the goods that are entering Canada have the, the ability to come in and are meeting all of our standards. We also have dog detector uh, teams that help with the detection of <coughs> currency, cigarettes, drugs, and explosives. We have intelligence officer. They are usually the ones that will be looking at trends, helping us figure out uh, the new modes of hiding, smuggling issues. Uh, we have a very, very uh, uh, good network of intelligence officer from one end of the country to the other. And they actually work overseas and with other countries with their intelligence department in Canada with OPP, our CMP, uh, Police of Quebec. Uh, so they, they're very well uh, looked at and their expertise is often looked at from other agencies and other police, station, um, police forces. We have targeting officers. Those are officers that will be looking at the manifest or the cargo, uh, the plane uh, passenger list. And they will look at uh, trends, they will look at history, look at criminality, and look at uh, figuring out which uh, loads should be inspected, which person should have a, a follow-up interview with an immigration officer. So they're valuable. They uh, don't take the, they don't replace the frontline worker because the frontline officer has all those powers as well, but they help us give us some real time intel that we sometimes don't have the time or uh, the ability to process at the line. So they're the backbone of our intelligence department. Investigations, often we unfortunately have people that are uh, at the border caught with uh, smuggling goods. So we do have investigators that will help put in packages with the legal department so that uh, the Crown will be able to proceed uh, and get the charges upheld while they go to court. We have security and facilitators for travelers and migrants, immigration. We have uh, the border risk assessment. We have uh, big data analysis. That's again with the uh, targeting and, and um, intelligence department. We have trade commission facilities and compliance. I was always saying commercial is very important. We have to make sure that uh, when goods are arriving in Canada, they are properly reported and they have the correct tariff codes. Well, the trade com commercial facilities are the ones that are helping us uh, determine sometimes if we, is this a handbag? Is it a plastic good? Is it, and they will help us. So that, that's very important for the commercial aspect. Revenue collection, as you know, a while ago I mentioned that we had over $55 billion in taxes collected. We also have um, penalties that, that are assessed after the fact for commercial goods. And we have a collection agency. Um, uh, we also have officers that have to collect duties and taxes on um, people returning to Canada with their goods they purchase on their holidays that are over their exemption. So we collect duties and taxes at that point. And uh, we also uh, have uh, Canadian industry assistance for all sorts of, we <clears throat> help over 90 acts of parliament and other uh, agencies. So we're, we're very, very busy. So the next slide. Yeah, that'll be me. So thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, right now the non-uniform positions. So basically, um, you know, people do not necessarily know that we have non-uniform positions, but of course we're there uh, to support the front line. Uh, so basically, um, just to continue with the border management. Um, so in the point of entries, there are some non-uniform positions as well. So there could be some admin positions, some clerical positions or whatnot. Uh, they're scattered like right across the country. So there are opportunities there. Um, and now I'm just going to speak about like a couple of uh, opportunities in other branches at the agency. So as you can see on this slide, uh, the science and technology branch. So um, the example of key activities here are advanced analytics, alcohol and tobacco characterization, border technology development, contraband drug analysis, customs analysis. 
um, etc. So uh, this branch mainly, um, I can give you an example. So for example, the new those kiosks that were developed when uh, travelers are returning from their vacations, those are developed from uh, you know by uh, employees who are working in the science and technology branch uh, and uh, softwares and whatnot. So they're responsible for that. So they are responsible for uh, designing, developing, uh, implementing innovative science and technology solutions to secure the border strategically. Uh, they also streamline and simplify the current and future border experience. So as I mentioned, uh, electronic solutions. And uh, the people who work in science and technology are problem solvers who thrive on making change happen. So in this branch as well, another example is that we have uh, web developers or junior developers. Uh, so they, they, they're responsible uh, for that as well. So internal services, uh, this is actually um, a, a very big piece. Uh, so uh, as you can see, the example of uh, key activities here, uh, we have uh, access information, privacy, ATIP, uh, audit and evaluation, communications. Of course, that's a very important piece. So whether it's internal communications or external communications uh, with the public, um, those who are responsible, for example, for our social media pages, uh, contracting and procurement, uh, you know, the contracts that we, you know, sign with, um, uh, with our suppliers, they're responsible for that, corporate planning, finance, of course, uh, our, our uh, people who handle our money, of course, <laughs> uh, information management and information technology, HR, uh, whether it's on the BSO, border services officer side or non-border services officer side, uh, people who handle staffing processes, the, the hirings, et cetera, uh, real property management. Uh, those are usually people who deal with the buildings, recourse, and security. So security, uh, for example, um, people who uh, once uh, employees are hired or prior to being hired, they have to conduct like a, an ex, um, a security clearance. So that's, uh, they're responsible for that. So, um, so just to summarize the slide, so they're responsible for finding robust, agile corporate solutions and services to help the CBSA meet its operational and business goals. Uh, they provide strategic guidance and support through key corporate functions that allow the agency to be a safe, accountable, efficient, and sustainable organization that best serves stakeholders and the public. So if we go on to the next slide here, um, the strategic policy branch. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, cabinet and parliamentary affairs. So, you know, those who deal with our politicians directly with whether it's MPs um, and other politicians or bureaucrats, uh, engagement and partnerships with national and international shareholders, policy research and planning, strategic planning and organizational priorities. So uh, in essence, there's, they strategically position the CBSA to lead Canada's border management policy agenda by working with partners and stakeholders to drive policy direction. Uh, they also ensure that innovative solutions are proactively developed to address emerging issues and policy priorities and steer the implementation of policies that contribute to effective, efficient, and coordinated border management. And as you can tell, uh, our, all of our career streams work together to ensure our borders and country uh, remain safe. So on to the next slide. Uh, Nicole, you can, uh, you can uh, speak to that. For self-declaration, the uh, Government of Canada is very committed to ensuring that we have a very good representation of the population in Canada. So to self-declare uh, for the public service is to make sure that if you and inform us if you are, when you apply, if you are a member of one of the four groups, so that is uh, a woman, uh, women, Indigenous uh, people, um, people with visible minority or people with uh, disability. The reason that we want to make sure that people de self-declare is that we wanna make sure we have the proper amount of representation. So um, we have started to, when we do have a process, one of the uh, questions in the application process will be, are you a member of the NEE group? And you can be a member of more than one group that's, that's uh, definitely for sure. You can declare for more than one group at a time. But during the process, it is voluntary, but we strongly re recommend that if you are a member, please to self-declare uh, when you do make an application. We can move on to the next slide. So on the top left-hand corner, we have one of our officers who's uh, at the time doing an immigration secondary. 
he uh, is um, conducting more or less uh, a criminality check and more in depth to make sure that the person is not coming up to work when they're telling us they're not coming up to work, if they are coming up to study to get a stomach study permit. On the bottom left, we have one of our students. That is a student BSO. So we have some uniform BSOs. They work at uh, international airports. And that officer right there is doing an interview at primary. So that is uh, welcoming a traveler or um, welcoming home a, a resident Canadian citizen and to ensure that they have properly declared their goods. Top right hand corner, we have one of our officers who is attending a funeral in his dress uniform. And on the bottom right hand corner, we have a chief. She is an indigenous individual who is a chief at the very, very busy port of entry. She is working at the Toronto airport as one of their three chiefs. So if we move on to the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. So. Um... I'm going to speak about hiring students in the federal government. So uh, as you can see on the slide here, we can hire students initially through these mechanisms. Uh, so the first one you see there on the slide, the uh, Federal Student Work Experience Program, or uh, better known as FSWEP. Uh, students can work part-time during their academic term, whether it's fall and winter, and during their non-academic term, which is the summer, and they can work part-time or full-time. FSWEP is an inventory that includes students at all levels uh, high school, CJEP, college, university, in 15 areas of study and over 250 specializations, who've identified interest in one of the 15 types of work and available uh, to work across Canada. So just a side note here that uh, these uh, mechanisms uh, is across the public service and not just at CBSA. So uh, we have many, many departments across the government. So I just want to add that. Uh, they are eligible under FSWEP if uh, they meet these three requirements. So you must be a full-time high school, CJEP, college or university student, returning to full-time studies in the next academic year, and meet the minimum age requirement in the province or territory of work. This includes students with physical or emotional disabilities deemed to have full-time status by their academic institution, Adult students registered in education and retraining programs at the secondary level may also be eligible for student employment programs. Students who are in their final year of academic study and who are not intending to return to full-time studies are eligible to work part-time up until the time they graduate. Uh, please note that preference will be given to Canadian citizens who meet the job requirements. However, if we don't find Canadian citizens, um, non-Canadians uh, uh, or residents can be considered, provided that they have the proper work permits to work. Uh, for the post-secondary co-op internship program, you can contact your school's co-op internship pro program coordinator and ask about public service work opportunities. Once you apply to a job placement, if you're selected for further consideration, you may be invited to write an exam and to participate in an interview. Uh, in terms of eligibility, uh, to be eligible for a public service job through this program, uh, you need to meet these three requirements. You must be a full-time student registered in a post-secondary uh, education co-op internship program that is on our list of validated institution and program. That you can, finally e uh, you can easily find that on Google. Uh, your work term must be mandatory for graduation, and you must meet the minimum age required in the province or territory of work. Uh, finally, for the research affiliate program, uh, you can work part-time as a research affiliate with the Government of Canada while pursuing your studies. Conducting innovative research related to your degree or program and gain experience with a federal department or agency. Working for Canada's top student employer, you'll enjoy a diverse and inclusive workplace and could kickstart a meaningful career that spans hundreds of fields and offers thousands of jobs across the country. You are eligible for this program if you meet these three requirements. If you are a full-time student within a post-secondary institution, you are enrolled in an academic program that requires research as part of your curriculum, and you meet the minimum age required in the province or territory of work. And this is the BSO, so I'll leave that to Nicole. So as Yeha was mentioning, we do have uniform positions for students, and the hiring process is a little bit uh, different because we have um, an application process from the EPSWEP. We receive that application. 
Following that application, we make a selection of people that are within the areas of the airports and the mailing center, and they will be off asked to come in and write the officer training entrance exam. That is the same exam that we have for uh, would-be officers. It is an online uh, test and it's an aptitude test. So there's really not much you can study for it, um, but it's very important that you follow all the, the guidelines and the instructions sent to you in the, inter, uh, in the e invitation email and also all the guidelines provided during the, the online testing. So at the beginning, they'll give you some uh, information about the test, which is pretty much make sure that you answer all of the questions. After the uh, uh, exam is done and we, you have a, a successful result, you will be invited to do an interview. Uh, those are a little bit modified, but they're very similar to the interviews that we do for our normal process. We have a list of competencies that we will send you out with the invitation to the, in, to the interview. And those are the competencies we will be evaluating during the interview. We will do this via role play, scenario, mise en place, and we need you to demonstrate at a certain level the competencies. If you are not successful demonstrating the competencies that we're asking, it doesn't mean you don't have them. It simply means you don't have them at the level that we are looking for. And we recommend that you try again later. A lot of people do need to, to do this interview as it's, it's a very intense and different in type of interview that sometimes it will take a couple of uh, attempts to be successful. Following the interview, we have a security clearance because we will be you will have a uh, baton and pepper spray and handcuffs and we'll, you will have to arrest people. So uh, it's part of your duties. So we want to make sure that you're uh, able to do that and that you're not able to and not subject to corruption. So we have to have a very in-depth security screening. Um, for other students jobs that are uh, CBSA, like uh, we can have non-uniform jobs as um, let's say we have a cashier at an airport collecting duties and taxes or working at a mail center to help officers. Those, it would be again, you would apply through the FSWEP, you would have an interview. And again, because of the uh, nature of our, our work, we do have sometimes some sensitive documents and sensitive information. So you would have to have a security clearance uh, in order to be hired as a student for non-uniform jobs as well. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I won't spend too much time on this slide. So these are examples of opportunities that we have for students um, in uh, both uniform, the first one there, junior program officer, and the rest is uh, non-uniform positions. So these are very specific to uh, examples of positions that we have at CBSA. However, uh, in other departments, they may have other opportunities. So it's not necessarily the same um, opportunities that are the same in uh, different departments as all government departments have different mandates uh, across government. So as you can see there, uh, we spoke about it briefly before, uh, the science and technology branch, we have uh, junior, junior computer programmers, uh, junior user support technicians. In the uh, internal services, we have junior financial officers, human resources officers, and in the strategic policy branch, examples of opportunities that we have for students uh, junior project officer and student researchers. Uh, so as we move on here to the next slide, so um, uh, these are the student rates of pay. So uh, as you can see here, um, the rates are associated with the academic level you are in right now, regardless if you are a first, second, third, or fourth year student. Uh, these rates are available online. So if you could just, if you want to Google Public Service uh, of Canada or uh, Government of Canada pay rates for students, uh, they are all accessible there. So you could search that through Google and uh, it's all there. So the reason why you see, see many steps there um, is that we have students who uh, work with us for many years. Uh, so uh, some of them, you know, are students, uh, whether it's one year, two years, three years, four years, et cetera, uh, which is why this is why you see uh, several steps in some of the um, uh, levels of uh, education. So uh, now we're going to talk about student bridging opportunities. So you've worked in the public service as a student, and now we want to talk about this uh, term. So what does it mean, uh, student bridging, exactly? Uh, so essentially, it means that once you have been employed through one of the public service student recruitment programs uh, that we mentioned on one of the previous slides before, 
so I'll just um, uh, remind you again, uh, FSWEP, uh, Indigenous Student Employment Opportunity, Employment Opportunity for Students with Disabilities, Other Inventories, Co-op Program, and the Research Affiliate Program. Uh, then there is the possibility of being bridged into the public service after graduating at the discretion of the uh, hiring manager. Uh, in terms of salary and benefits, uh, so these are, uh, you know, uh, it applies across government. So uh, we have competitive salaries that vary on the group and level of the position. Uh, we also have professional and personal development uh, programs to help you grow in your career at the CVSA. So for example, in our branch, the HR branch, uh, we do have a developmental program from uh, the group and level PE1 to PE3. And uh, for the BSO side, uh, in the FB group, there is the developmental program from the FB2 to FB3. Um, and also you're able to get internal training via the Canada School of Public Service and external training, which is relevant to your field of work. So you can easily go up to your manager and ask them, you want some training uh, and of course with their approval, you know, they can approve training through an, uh, a third party supplier. Um, we also have dental health and healthcare plans, uh, good life memberships at discount rates. Uh, for all employees across government, uh, we have vacation for new employees start with 15 days. Uh, various paid and unpaid leaves that provide you with options for unexpected events in your life. So for example, family related leave who provides you with the flexibility uh, to take care of your family in certain situations. Uh, we have attractive and competitive pension plans. And at CBSA, we offer a workplace that offers stability and flexibility that fits your life. So um, in terms of non-uniform positions, so this is a typical uh, application process if you're applying through uh, our external website, which is uh, jobs.gc.ca or uh, Canada.ca slash jobs. Um, and this is, this is uh, you know, almost the same process in, you know, all of government for, you know, non-uniform positions. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, when you apply to a staffing process in terms of accommodation. So if you apply and your candidacy is retained and you need accommodation for testing or for interviews or, or um, anything else during the staffing process, each poster is mentioned mentions uh, that accommodations um, uh, can be requested at any point of the process. So that is clearly on all of our posters. Uh, so it's very clear there that uh, accommodations can be requested anytime. Um, so just very briefly, um, the application process is uh, what you see on the screen here, but it can also differ slightly uh, for each job. So uh, for each online application, I should say. So it includes assessments such as exams and interviews. Uh, and so we offer various types of employment. So casual, so casual is a, like a 90 day contract, a 90 day working contract per year per department. So you can't do more than 90 days. We have terms, which is uh, usually, a, uh, it could be for an, a determinate period. So basically it could be four months, five months, six months, one year, et cetera. And of course, we have indeterminate positions. So uh, it'll, it'll be well indicated on the job poster itself. So as for the process, you know, you apply to our uh, positions uh, via the Government of Canada website, uh, which I've mentioned, so jobs.gc.ca. And you can even set up a, a career alert uh, to be the first to be notified of our opportunities and other government departments as well. Uh, the recruitment process usually includes screening, various tests and or interviews to access your candidacy. And uh, at the end of the process, if you're qualified, uh, usually there's a creation of a pool of candidates where hiring managers can come in and select candidates or uh, receive an offer of employment. And I'll leave it to Nicola now who will talk about the uh, application process for the BSO side. Okay, so for the um, process is uh, very time consuming. It could take up to two years from the time you apply to the time you are hired. And unfortunately, COVID has slowed things down drastically for us. So you apply online first at canada.gc.ca. Even if we don't have presently an open poster, what you do is you go set up your account and uh, set up notification so that as soon as a poster does open up, you will get an email and you will be able to uh, put your re resume right away. 
usually our posters are not uh, up for very long. So usually only about a week long because we get so many applicants. The last poster we ran was just uh, last month. Uh, it was open for bilingual only for one week and we had more than uh, close to 3000 applicants. So when it is not an, a bilingual poster, like the one we are planning to have out in January, we can get more than 6,000 applicants easy. So that's why you wanna make sure that you get your notification because if we get too many applicants, the poster will close. So make sure you set up an account at uh, canada.gc.ca for a notification. Once the, uh, pro uh, the um, process is closed, we do a triage and then we, we go by a specific amount of people, like 500 people at a time or 250, because we, like I said, we have over 6,000 people. We can't have everyone at every stage at the same time because it's our ground to grind to a halt. So it, it's very so, uh, easy for one person to be at the first uh, stage of the process while someone has already gone through and is in the last stage. Uh, that's why this the process can take up to two years. The officer training exam is the same as the one we were talking about earlier in the student process. So it's an online aptitude test. There's no way to really prepare for an aptitude test, but on our webpage, we do have a few uh, example questions uh, and a little sample test so that people are a little bit more at ease and comfortable. Again, it's very important to follow the instructions from the email that you will receive and the test itself, the, uh, the um, instruction they're going to give you because it is a timed test. Once you're successful at the test, you will be again invited to an interview. Same process as before, you will be given the list of the competencies that we will be evaluating throughout the interview. And um, you have a chance to Google the competencies, see what they mean and prepare yourself for the interview. We used to do the interviews in person at uh, some, some of our major sites, but with COVID right now, we are doing all of our interviews via phone. But for our next process in January, we do hope that we will be able to do the interviews uh, via uh, Zoom or MS Team or one, uh, one of those platforms, so we will have a video as well. Next assessment is the MMPI, which is a psychological test. This is a test that we need to outsource. So we have to hire an outside companies to provide these tests. With COVID, a lot of these facilities had to close, but they have since reopened on an online type process. First part is an in-depth questionnaire that you are uh, provided and you respond questions. Um, it's a type of uh, like a fill in the, the, the bubble, uh, for your answer. So it's a quite uh, intense, a lot of questions. Uh, I think there's over 500 questions, but once that's done, the uh, a, a psychologist or a psychologist will be getting in touch with you and having a formal interview. This is, uh, like I said, a private company said do that across the country. So it, it is a bit time consuming to try to get them online, set up the appointments and everything. So again, that's one of the reasons our process takes so long. Following the MMPI, we do have a medical examination. For that, you can Google or do whatever search engine for a Health Canada Category 3 health exam. For those exams, um, if you wear glasses, as long as you wear your glasses during the exam and you're, you, they test your vision and you have a, a sufficient vision, you, it's ac acceptable. Same thing for hearing aids. As long as you are able to hear at the right level, with the A's, you will not be disqualified. Uh, a lot of police agencies, if you're um, colorblind, you will be eliminated from the process. CBSA, we don't recognize uh, colorblindness as a disadvantage. So if you can be colorblind and be an officer. The, the test is not intrusive. So it's just uh, blood pressure, eyes, uh, reflexes. There's no blood work or anything like that that's done but it is done by a Health Canada physician. So as you can imagine with everything going on in the world right now, the doctors are extremely busy. So it, it can be, uh, take a long time uh, to get an appointment. We have the specific uh, doctors. We will make the appointment for the candidates as close to their home uh, as possible to limit the amount of travel, but uh, you would be contacted and given your, your appointment with the doctor. 
Following that, we have the security clearance. The security clearance is uh, top se um, se secret uh, level. We have a, a giant questionnaire that has to be filled out. The last 10 years, where did you live? Schooling, family questions, uh, all these uh, uh, questions about school and work. It's to ensure that you are not corruptible. But following the big test, there is also, uh, sorry, Following the big questionnaire, there is an uh, interview. So there will be checks with the RCMP and CSIS as well uh, during that stage. Once that stage is complete, we have the second language uh, equivalent. That is a, a requirement only if you are uh, uh, asking for a bilingual poster. So if you're uh, asking to be hired as a bilingual officer, you will get tested. If you're in our general pool or our general process, you will not be tested for that. Uh, we have practice, uh, the public service has a, a list of exactly how the um, levels are determined and how they are tested. And they even have some wonderful practice sample tests online. So again, you can Google a search engine or, or uh, public service uh, language requirements and that will give you access to those. The next part, there is a cost for the candidate for this particular one. It's a physical condition evaluation. We require the uh, pair test, which is the preparation that is used by the RCMP. It is a, a test that measures physical fitness with, you must run uh, with so many laps, push, pull, uh, push-ups, jump over a fence. There's a whole bunch of steps for that. And uh, the best, best way to prepare for that is go online to YouTube and Google RCMP pair test. And they have a couple of uh, videos that show exactly how the test is ran, how it is evaluated, and also some very practical tips on how to get prepared physically. Uh, we do have a, a component of our course that uh, at our WeGo training that is uh, physical ground defense and uh, self-protection, protection of others, how to handcuff people. So it's very important that you be in, in good physical condition and that test is me measures that. The PEARS test is something that the, the candidate must um, book themselves and they must also pay the, the cost for that test. At this time, CBSA does not uh, reimburse the cost of the test, but we are because of these uh, closures of many of these sites because of COVID looking at alternatives, uh, police, other police testing, the uh, um, uh, army test and uh, some of the fire, fire uh, brigade tests. We are looking at accepting those, but they are also uh, pair dated. That means that they are only valid for 16 to 12 months, depending on the test. So, and it needs to be valid on your day you enter the college. So we recommend that a candidate not look at that step until they have received confirmation that they were successful at the interview because there is a cost and there is a time limit on that specific uh, test. The next section is the firearm safety and fi uh, course and test. And that again is the candidate's responsibility to find the course and to pay for uh, the, the sessions. That though it does not have a, a, a date, date end date. Once you've passed that course, it's, a, it's always uh, gonna be good for you. Uh, if you are a hunter or for whatever reason already have those papers, then that's fine. You just, uh, once you get to that level, that uh, step of the interview process, uh, hiring process, we will contact you and ask you for the, the information you just send it to us. If you already had the test and can't find the, the uh, documentation, that's not a problem. You just can uh, contact the minister in the province that you live, that you took the test, the courses in, and they will provide you with a copy of the test. But again, because there is a cost to that, to the candidate, we ask that you wait until you uh, hear from us saying that you have passed the interview section before you start looking at those steps. So that is why it is a very lengthy process. Um, but uh, when we get through the end of the process, we have uh, candidates that we are going to really invest in. Once they're at the college, we are gonna work with them to get them on the front line. So that's the process.
Okay, thank you. Uh, so what we're looking for, uh, so core values at the CBSA, the CBSA is seeking individuals of all backgrounds who share our core values and ethics of service, excellence, respect, integrity, and professionalism. Uh, we treat others the way we would like to be treated. Other things we're looking for in a candidate are highly motivated people who are passionate about our mandate and will work with us to achieve our mandate of securing our country. People with great analytical skills, the ability to adapt in an ever-changing environment. Career-minded people, as you can have multiple careers within the CBSA. You can work in any of our career streams that we've discussed already. Uh, so to conclude, um, so for the non-uniform side, uh, we have a resume that, so in addition to applying uh, externally to uh, our website, jobs.gc.ca, uh, we've also implemented, we have a resume database that is accessible by all of our HR advisors across Canada. Uh, so if you are interested in opportunities at the CBSA and would like to have your resume included in our resume database, you can send it to the email address there that is indicated on the screen, which is cbsa.talent.asfc at cbsa-asfc.gc.ca. If a hiring manager is interested in your candidacy, they will get in touch with you directly. Uh, we encourage you uh, all to follow us on our different social media platforms. So we have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, and uh, you can see there we, we also have um, a careers website as well, which, is, which has a lot of information on recruitment as well. So you could go there and check out uh, our recruitment webpage, uh, whether it's uniformed and non-uniformed. Uh, so on my behalf, um, thank you very much for uh, listening to the presentation today. So I'll uh, pass it on to Nicole if she wants to uh, add in some any concluding remarks. I would also like to thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, do these two uh, information sessions. Uh, the Government of Canada and most specifically the agency CBSA are trying to increase the number of uh, people with disability. We want to be all inclusive, we want to be representative of the Canadian public and uh, we need to have a good representation and this is wonderful that we were able to speak with you today. So again, thank you very much for including us uh, this week. Thank you, Nicole and Yehi, for this presentation. And as folks can see, there are lots of opportunities in uniformed and non-uniformed positions within the Canada Border Services Agency. And, um, and, and as Nicole mentioned, of course, the particularly because of the Accessible Canada Act, actually, but um, um, I think um, the, the federal government and federal agencies and Crown Corporations are, are actively trying to increase representation of people with disabilities within their workplaces. And I think there are opportunities um, for thousands of, um, of jobs across uh, the federal uh, government and, and agencies and Crown Corporations over the next um, uh, year or so, a couple of years, I think that the, um, the, there's an effort to hire about 5,000, at least 5,000 new employees with disabilities within different organizations. So um, um, I'd like to now open up the floor to any questions that people have. Uh, we're happy to have this event run a little bit over, over time if, if, um, if the folks from CBSA are able to uh, continue to, to be here for another few minutes. So if you have a question, you could raise your hand or you can just speak out if you like. Um, and uh, please go ahead. Any questions from anybody? Yeah, hi, Frank. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, uh, I have a quick question. Um, just because I know as a student, I, I had this sort of experience where um, I worked for several federal agencies, including um, like the RCMP, and I did some security clearance. Um, is that something that's transferable to the CBSA um, when, when you go through applicants? 
Yes, you are able to uh, move from one agency to another if you are in the program and you will be uh, continuing on the, the following year as a student, yes. And then we also have bridging that you can bridge from one department to the other. But if it's going to be a uh, BSO position, you must go through the entire uh, hiring process in order to uh, meet the standards. That's Thanks. a good question. No. Do others have questions? And I, and I should say, of course, that we have recorded the presentation today, so we're going to make it available on our YouTube um, channel um, a few days after this event, including the, the session that was done, on, done in French on Wednesday. We recognize this National Access Awareness Week, or, or I guess it's Accessibility Awareness Week this week, so there are lots of events going on and competing interests. We wanna make sure as many people as possible are able to um, experience this presentation. We'll do that by making it available online. So anybody else have, you could put a comment in the chat. You could um, you could raise your hand if you want, um, if you have any questions for Nicole or Gehi. Okay. Well, all right, well, I, I'd like to thank um, the folks from CBSA uh, for joining us today and thank all of you for taking part in this event. Oh, we do have a question. We do have a question. And I was actually thinking about the same thing. Um, so the question from Driss is, are there any um, opportunities for people who are blind or have vision loss within the CBSA? Uh, well, I know when I started with CBSA, one of our HR personnel director in Ottawa at HQ was um, uh, vis vis was blind. She couldn't see, mm -hmm. um, but she has since retired. So, yes, it is possible to work with visual vision impairment at CBSA. Yeah, and I guess the thing is that you've got. I guess it depends on the nature of the job, right? So you've yes. got lots of. Um, yeah. There may be certain uniform positions, I guess, on the front line that will require uh, vision, but then there are all sorts of other positions you were talking about, you know, uh, positions in, in accounting and HR and all those other sorts of positions that, you know, very big department um, that, that may not require, um, uh, have the certain physical requirements or, or uh, vision um, requirements that some of the frontline positions might have, right? Correct. That is correct, yeah. Okay, so, and, and, and another, any other questions or comments? Welcome back. Do you mind if I ask one more question here? I apologize. Sure. Um, but uh, I guess I'm wondering about, um, say like recent graduates, like you talked about sort of bridging from, like if you're already a student employed, uh, that sort of thing, but do you have recent graduate programs as well or? Uh, is it mostly focused on students that have already sort of uh, worked within the agency? Uh, for the well, for the non-uniform side, uh, yes, uh, we do have managers who hire uh, recent graduates. So, uh, you know, we do participate in uh, uh, a lot of post-secondary school uh, recruiting events or career fairs, and you know, a lot of managers uh, do like to go there and. Uh, you know, uh, speak with candidates, potentially, you know, even um, hire, you know, hiring them as well, right? So, uh, of course, that's, that's really up to the sub uh, hiring manager to, to do that. Uh, uh, you know, there is different hiring me mechanisms in the public service. So there is the job posters, there's, um, you know, there's uh, extra uh, non advertised as well. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, another hiring mechanism that hiring managers can do in the public service. So student bridging is also considered a non-advertised um, uh, staffing appointment. So uh, yes, we do that. And we do also have um, some competitions that come in the fall. Uh, for example, post-secondary recruitment for, for example, financial officers. Uh, there's uh, for procurement officers, usually those happen like in the fall. There's a, it's a post that usually goes up every uh, around the fall time, September, October, November. I, I don't have the exact month exactly, 
uh, which is focused exactly on post-secondary recruitment and um, people who have recently graduated. So yes, there is that possibility for sure. Okay, thanks. No problem. That's, that's great. Um, what, a, what an interesting um, presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you as well, Gilda, for uh, joining us today and You're representing welcome. guests as a partner in this, in this uh, uh, particular series of two events this week with CBSA. And we continue to partner with the KEPS on, on various events and initiatives. And I just want to mention that our next needs community engagement event is totally different. It's um, on the Mars CIBC Inclusive Design Challenge. And we have Tim Rose, Senior Manager Inclusion and Diversity with CIBC who will be speaking about that design challenge, which is um, open to individuals and organizations. And of course, folks with disabilities who have are probably best positioned to, to, um, to present um, um, solutions um, and accessible um, uh, you know, opportunities um, in, the, in the employment realm. And, and so the contest actually has prizes from 5,000 to 50,000. The first part, uh, place prize is $50,000. The contest is running to the end of June. So after Tim's presentation next Friday, June 11th from noon to one, there's still close to uh, well, two and a half weeks, almost three weeks to put together a presentation to the CRBC um, Mars Inclusive Design Competition. So that's what's happening next Friday. And we will continue to have needs community engagement events. And sometimes we, we call them coffee chats. So if you have your favorite beverage, coffee or tea with you, then you can consider it a coffee chat if you, if you want. Uh, we'll be doing events probably fewer in the summer, but and things will be picking up again in the fall. But uh, thank you again for joining us today. And if you have further questions for Nicole, um, uh, he or um, uh, uh, Jessica, who's also here from CBSA, then you can you can email me frank.smith at needs.ca, and I can um, put you in touch with uh, with. Uh, with them. Uh, so um, thanks again for joining us and I hope you all have a wonderful uh, weekend and we hope to see you soon at another NEATS event. And, and uh, yes, thanks again. Thank you. Care, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.